everybody doing this, this afternoon? There, I, I like you. It's loud. It's good. It's Vegas, right? Come on now. It's good. Well, I'm glad you're here. We're gonna today. We're gonna have some fun. Most importantly, we're gonna feed you, which is good. But then we're gonna talk about a revolutionary new product that's helped me in my practice. I'm in practice just like you folks. I've got lots of competition in the small town that I'm in. We I have a town of about 25, 30,000. I'm the 13th OD in that town. So there's a lot of competition, a lot of independent competition. So I'm going to talk about the products today or how we can separate ourselves from our competition and deliver some measurable benefits to our patients. Like Dr. Purcell said, I'm pretty good at uh, taking a complex topic and making it understandable for me because sometimes the stuff's way above me. But that's what we've got my good friend and colleague, Mark, for here in the, in the, tail ha the uh, second half of the presentation. It gets pretty dicey, so we have the expert as far as the leading dominant eye goes. But before we get there, we need to talk a little bit about how Essilor comes up with their lens designs. Because just like you, I have choices. I can pick any lens that I want to from anywhere. So why do I keep going back to Essilor? And this is why right here. It's the live optics process that they use. In my opinion, my humble opinion, it's different than any other company out there. Because these products begin and end with our patient's vision in mind. The designers at Essilor know what's not working with our patients and progressive lenses. We know every day because we hear it. We hear the problems that patients have. And so when the new design comes out, they're trying to address that problem. How can they make a design that fits a problem that our patients are having? And this process is pretty unique because it starts with virtual reality. They try designs, hundreds of designs on different patients and see what works and what doesn't. If it passes that step, it goes to the next step on prototyping, trying these products out in the real world on patients. And if any step along the way, it doesn't meet their high expectations, it starts back again. So for me as an ECP, what that gives me is the ability and the confidence when I talk about this product to a patient and I put it on their face, because folks, at the end of the day, that's how we're judged, is how well our patients can see. Everything else in the office can be great, but if we put a poor design, a poor pair of glasses on them, our patients think they have no idea what we're talking about. So with this process behind the products that they sell, I know as an ECP, I'm confident that the things that have changed are gonna be very meaningful to my patients and my practice. Anybody ever had this in their dispensary? I'm sure it's just not in Oklahoma. You get those new patients in a progressive, put it on the first time, it's great. We're gonna take your vision back to where it was 15 years ago. You can see everything and they say, oh, I feel like I'm moving, what's going on? I've got this swim, this distortion. I'm feeling a little sick to my stomach. That's a problem patients have. So we're gonna talk about today nanoptics technology. That's the solution that Essilor has for that problem. Here's one that hits my heart a little closer to home. How many times have we had patients in our practices that say they can't read with their progressive lenses? You get them back in the exam chair. I know my card, 428739, that's 2020, that's small print. They're reading it with their progressive lenses on and you're going, whoa, you see better than I do up close. What's the issue? The issue is it's not natural vision for them. It's not the wide field of view they're used to. We're gonna talk about synchronized technology today. It's expansive vision. It's giving that patient back the visual field that they want and that they need. So here it is in a nutshell. This is S-Series, Verilux S-Series. Revolutionary new product. Many patents behind the concept, the design that we're gonna talk about today. So when you think about nanoptics, patients are gonna feel better when they wear that, okay? We go to synchronized technology. They're gonna see better, expansive vision top to bottom, edge to edge. And then what Dr. Bullimore is gonna talk about today, seeing faster, and how important that is to our patient's overall experience. The fundamental concepts in Verilux S-Series are nanoptics and synchronized technology. You'll find it throughout the platform that we talk about today. These are things different than we've seen in any other progressive lens in the past, okay? Let's spend just a little bit of time and talk about nanoptics, okay? 
and we're talking about the fixing the problem of distortion when our patients put on progressive addition lenses, especially the first time progressive wear. Now you may be sitting there wondering, okay doc, we, distortion's present in every progressive lens. It's out there, but my patients are doing fine. And they are doing okay because they're adapting to it. Because that's the best solution we've had until now. So now we don't have to have our patients adapt to something that they shouldn't have to. All right, now no one run out of the back on this slide. Yes, it is ray tracing. And it scares the heck out of me. I know Mark, he loves it. He got really excited right there when he saw it, because that's what he taught for a number of years in, at the Buckeye State. But this is fundamental to how this lens works. So to review, oh boy, going back to Optics 101, we see that if we're looking through the center part of the lens, that object O is right where it should be, center of the lens. Now think about for a second as we deviate through the peripheral part of that lens. If we look at point B, it actually appears in space to be at B prime. Okay, we all remember that now, all right? And that is ray deviation. It's not where it really is in space, okay? Eyes are playing tricks on us. That lens is doing something to that spot. Well, what's the big deal about that? When you have ray deviation, you're going to have a swim effect on a lens. And so what happens here, as we move through the peripheral part of that lens, remember, the power profile is changing. When the power profile changes, we have prismatic deviation. And we can see up here that that's going to move the point where we think we're looking at further away. And when we have that on this grid, for example, that grid does not appear like it should. It's distorted. Now, once we put motion into that equation, whether I'm moving as the wearer or whether the object I'm looking at is moving, that distortion of that image leads to swim. So it's all about prismatic deviation. Now, thankfully, we can measure that. So if you take the difference between A prime and B prime over here, divide that by the, the power profile change, you're going to get the prismatic deviation. And if we get that closer to zero, we've created a solution that has minimal to no swim. So remember what's happening in a progressive lens. We take it for granted. Our patients are looking through different powers as they move their eyes through the lens, or if they move their heads back and forth, okay? What does that look like when we start talking about lenses? Well, here's something that many of us know and love. That's a traditional PAL. We're talking design on the front, talking power on the back. It's what we've done for a number of years. Well, how in the world do we accomplish the vision in there? Because we have a minus one up top and a plus two on the bottom. It's a change in base curve of that lens. Okay, we all know that. When we think about what happens down here, look how much more curved that part of the lens gets compared to the top. When you have different curvatures, you have different magnifications. So of course, the top part here minifies the lens and leads to barrel distortion of a grid. We have magnification at the bottom, we have pin cushion distortion, okay? So just remember that for a little bit. Now, let's contrast that to the Verilux S shape. A revolutionary shape because if we look down here, the add part of the lens is flatter than the top part. We're able to accomplish a change in power without a change in magnification because of the cool S shape of the lens, where the name comes from, okay? We're only able to do this because we can use both sides of the lens. There's complex elements on the front and the back of the lens that accomplish this goal. When we overlay these, look what happens. Because it's the same image, but the lines bow differently through different parts of the lens, once we add motion into that equation, you can see what happens. We get distortion. We get the motion sickness, the swim effect that our patients don't love. We look over here, the S, Verilux S, look what happens. Those objects are much more similar. So we've eliminated the swim effect that our patients can experience. So digital fixes everything, right? We hear that a lot. Oh, it's digital. It's better. I would agree to some extent it's more accurate. But what we have over here, that's a full backside PAL. It's digital. We've moved everything to the back, okay? 
but it's still single surface. You still have the same compromise. You still have the same problem with magnification. It does the exact same thing. When we overlay those, put them in motion, it's the same thing. It's still a single surface lens. So we still have a magnification difference between the top and bottom part of the lens. We don't have that with the Verilux S. Revolutionary concept that creates a power change without having a magnification change. There's no prism or ray deviation in this lens. Unwanted ray deviation. All right, how does this work in practice? So on, on your left over here, we have a digital progressive. There we go, okay? Different powers through the top and the bottom, okay? Now, what happens as that ray trace, that light ray goes to the bottom part of the lens, it's going to deviate for reasons we've already talked about. And on the stair step model right there, it's gonna to lead to some bowing. This is where patients talk about trouble walking down stairs, trouble walking off a curb. I know we all hear that in our practices. Remember, the Verilux S, uses nanoptics technology, optical elements that redefine how the lens shape comes out, and we don't have that same unwanted ray deviation, so the stairs appear more true to their natural shape. All right, let's up it a notch here, and let's move that to a plus three ad. You ever had those patients you took out of a flat top, 20, or flat top 28, put them into progressive? It's kind of a nightmare sometimes, and this is why right here because now all of a sudden there's all this unwanted deviation and a smaller field of view that they're not used to. But think about this in practice. Look how much those stairs are bowed. Look how much unwanted ray deviation is there. We can eliminate that with the Verilux S series and nanoptics technology. So one of the fundamental things of Verilux S series throughout the platform is nanoptics technology. When you leave here today just think, hey, that's a new way, new shape to the lens that creates the same effect without, without the magnification change. So we get rid of the unwanted light deviation by using this product. Let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about the reading area. Because at the end of the day, I think that's in my practice where I see most of my issues with my progressive lenses is problems reading. Patient's not happy, not able to read, not comfortable with the vision that's provided in there. Well, if we think about how progressive lenses have been made in the past, the company gets the prescription for the left eye and the right eye from our offices, and they maximize the design for the left eye, and they maximize the design for the right eye based on those respective prescriptions. Sounds great, right? The problem is they don't think about the visual system working together as one unit. So they're customized for the left eye and the right eye separately. So have any of you ever had those patients in your dispensary that say, man, I see great when I do this or when I do that. What do you want to say? Stop doing that, right? Well, there's a reason for that because their visual system wants to work together as a team. The brain wants information from the left eye and the right eye inputting information in and working together to create one image at the same time. And that's what synchronized technology is. When this product, this technology, what it does, it takes the first step. It takes wearer parameters and creates the settings that are needed for the binocular visual system. And then the binocular optical target is set. We know what we want. We've got information from the left eye. We've got information parameters from the right eye. We're putting that together. And when the lens design is applied, they take that binocular optical target and spread it between both lenses so the eyes can, for the first time, work together as a team. And when the eyes do that, we have expansive vision throughout edge-to-edge -edge clarity, so patients perceive a much wider field of view up close because the eyes are working how they want to. They're working together. By having the eyes work together and increasing that field of view up close, we've answered one of the problems that our patients have. As eye care practitioners, we know that's an issue with progressive lenses, so now we have a solution to do that 
and that's Verilux S series with synchronized technology. All right, now the last piece of the puzzle. I hope some of you are excited up to this point in time. I know I am in my practice because this answers some problems that I have on a day in, day out basis with my patients. I have a solution for that. But now we're going to take it one step further in this presentation. We're going to start talking about Verilux S 4D and introduce a concept called the leading dominant eye. Now as eye care practitioners, we all know that there's a leading dominant eye. If we fit contact lenses for years, we know this, but we haven't applied it to spectacle lenses until now. And there's some benefits that Dr. Bullimore will talk about here in a few minutes on why it, identifying that is important and applying designs to that eye can make us actually see better, see faster. I don't know how you perceive your patients in your practice. I hope that you perceive your patients as patients, first and foremost, but a close second is customers. And I know that can be a bad word to some people, but folks, we have both in our practice. That's what makes our profession so exciting. We're doctors, we're opticians, we have patients, all right? But they come to us because we have the knowledge that they seek. We, they have problems with their visual system, and we provide the solutions to that problem. And yes, we sell them, but we're not salespeople. We need to provide our patients with the informed information that they want so they can make the smart purchasing decision for them. Our customer base is changing. They demand, they expect technology. Our profession evolves technology all the time. But one thing that hasn't evolved much is how we take measurements for these high-tech progressive lenses. I know in my practice, OCTs, visual field machines, automated refraction. Go, go look at the refractive equipment over there. It's digital, it's automated, it's exciting. Everything's changing. My progressive lenses I use are changing. They're digital, they're customized. What am I still doing? when I take a Sharpie and a wooden ruler stick out and measure their PD and measure their seg height. I'm using 50-year-old technology for that. Our customers want a difference. The good news is, if we employ this technology, they're willing to pay more for it, which is exciting. Because with technology comes a price tag. But 85% of patients surveyed would pay more for that because as we increase the consulting time with the patient, the perceived value of that product increases. So we can see up here, patient buys their glasses online, not a lot of perceived value in that. How cheaply can I get it done? How quickly can I get it done? We move up the scale here. The independent practices, just like mine, yours, that have a digital measuring device in there, right now, that's the best we can do as far as consulting time and perceived value. I know when we transitioned in my practice to having a digital measuring device, the things were amazing, what our patients were saying. Because our patients are demanding better technology. They want more precise fit, and they want designs customized for them. Just like their smartphones, just like their computers, okay? Do we need to take measurements? Is it important to have digital devices measure things? The opticians in my office are awesome. They measure a seg height 20 times better than I do. I guarantee you day in, day out basis. They hate it when I come and measure a seg height and say mine's right, yours wrong. That's not true. They're excellent at what they do. But here's the problem here. When we assume that our patients fit the normal, we're making a poor assumption because this study right here was over 200,000 wearers of glasses. And we found that if we take the default values for vertex, panto, and wrap angle, less than 9% fit the norm. That means one out of the six patients in your practice fit the normal. So when you turn an order into your lab and say, my patient's normal, they're not. May not be a big deal for a small RX, huge deal for a bigger RX, okay? So let's say, well, Let's expand these parameters. You're, you're cutting it way too close here. Let's increase it by a millimeter in degree, one degree. Guess what happens? One out of five. 
So the best case scenario is one out of five of our patients that we order with the old technology fit the norm. That may work for traditional surface lenses that we've had for years, but it doesn't make any sense with these new designs that are available for us, or we can truly take patient's vision to the next level. And I'm talking about that wow effect. When you put a pair of wonderful glasses, great design on a patient, and they can tell the difference, you've changed that patient's life, and now you have a patient for the rest of your career, and they're gonna tell people about that experience. So now we're gonna pass over to my good friend and colleague, Dr. Mark Bullimore, and he is gonna take us through the importance of the leading dominant eye. Well, thank you, Ryan. You are welcome. Give him a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. He's a, he's a tough act to follow, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, this is an old slide from the vision science literature, but basically what we're seeing on the far left is that our visual sensitivity, the way in which our eyes work together, we get a 50% bonus by having two eyes working together in perfect coordination. But as we blur one eye, we, we lose that advantage. So clearly if we cover one eye, we've lost that 50% advantage that we have from two eyes working together. But if we blur it a little more, we're actually worse off. That line goes below the axis and we're actually better off with one eye than we are with two eyes and one being blurred. The same applies with stereopsis. So just look at the, slide, the uh, figure on the right here. Um, we have exquisite binocular vision under normal circumstances. But if we blur our eyes, obviously we don't do quite so well in terms of our depth perception. But again, perhaps surprisingly, if we blur one eye, which is the line at the top that's dashed, if we blur one eye, we're worse off than blurring two eyes by the same amount. And what the Verilux 4S technology does, it takes that into account when we design two lenses rather than just considering the right lens and the left lens independently. Now the other thing I want to talk about is the concept of the dominant eye. All of us are right-brained or left-brained and we know our partners, our friends, we know whether they're right-brained, left-brained in terms of uh, uh, their personalities. But when we think about right eye and left eye, the same thing applies. Some people are right eye dominant, some people are left eye dominant. I'm unusual because I'm right-handed, but I'm left eye dominant. So that's important to consider as well when we're fitting and designing progressive edition lenses as a pair. Um, when we think about the dominant eye, it does three things better, okay? It gets to the target better. It gets to the target that we're looking at faster. Its reaction times are quicker. And it also sees a little clearer. So we need to pay attention to that when we're designing a pair of Verilux S-series lenses. And, but what they do, or what they did, was they had the subject look at a series of targets around the screen. These were little illiterate uh, uh, tumbling E-targets. And the patient had to fixate, and the patient had to uh, identify the orientation of the letter. And they measured not only how correct they were, but how quickly the eye fixations was moved. And they did it under normal binocular conditions, but with blurring either the dominant eye or the non-dominant eye. So these are some of the, this is what their uh, results look like. Uh, again, looks like something out of Star Wars. This person is clearly using the force. <laughs> and you can see from the results, if I can get to that right slide here, if you blur the dominant eye, even by three quarters of a diopter, you get about 100 milliseconds reduction in performance. But when you put the blur in front of the non-dominant eye, the visual system is quite to tolerant of that. So again, when we're designing a pair of progressive edition lenses, customizing them to the patient, we need to take into account which is the dominant eye. We need to really focus our design on the dominant eye because we need to get that one right. If we're gonna make compromises, and invariably we have to, those compromises are better tolerated 
if they're done with the, with the non-dominant eye. So in conclusion, Ryan and I are going to sort of uh, talk a little bit back and forth and be a little less, less formal. Um, so let me, let me sort of turn the first question back to you, uh, Ryan. Um, you fit these lenses in your practice. Um, you advocate for them. How do you present them to the patient? You know, I think presentation is extremely important. And when I first started using this product, I kind of pigeonholed for certain patients, maybe ones that were new to a progressive lens or ones that have had trouble in the past. And, and uh, then I saw something very interesting. As, as one of my patients was going through the fitting process for this product, I had another patient that I had already done our job and was out the door that we had put in another lens that we used, didn't put that patient through all this system. And she said, hey, what's that? I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm doing a disservice. So now we present it to every patient in our practice. Now, do I say every patient walks out with the Verilux S series lens? Of course not. But every patient knows about it. And my big thing, I have this really weird fear being in the town that I'm in because there's lots of us independent ODs there. So my big fear is like, they say this is a group of people in my town that are having dinner together at night. And they, a couple of them went to the eye doctor. I know it's kind of a stretch, but work with me here. And they're talking about their experience. And one of them talks about this brand new lens that's out that has new technology, new design. And she heard about it from her OD. But I didn't do my job and I didn't talk about it. Am I going to see my patient back ever again? Did I do anything wrong? No. She had a great experience in my office, but I dropped the ball. I didn't educate my patient on the newest technology that's available. Doesn't mean they're all going to purchase it, but I want them to know about it, and then they can make an educated decision. So now, every patient that can wear a progressive lens hears about it. Yeah, so when I was teaching uh, optometry students, yeah, you know, when we used to start teaching them about bifocals, we used to tell them the importance of, of uh, PD and seg height. And now with progressives, you had to measure monocular PD and get that right and get the fit-in height right. We have all this technology now in terms of lens design. It's, we have to leverage that by taking more and more measurements because we can only really optimize the experience for a patient by taking into account things like not only PD and, and fit in height, but also tilt and wrap and where their uh, central rotation is. It's like you know, going to buy a luxury car. I mean, I don't dr drive a luxury car, but I'd like to one day. Uh, maybe if I do enough of these uh, speaking engagements, I'll be able to. But if you go and buy any car, one of the th first things you do when you get into the car is you adjust the seat. You might raise it, lower it, move it back and forward. Imagine buying a luxury car, but not being able to adjust the seat. Okay, and to me, that the analogy here is this digital technology that we're, everybody's now excited about. Essilor are doing a fabulous job in terms of leveraging that because we're now able to take so many more measurements and customize the wearing experience to our patients in a way we really couldn't have dreamed of 10 years ago. So that's, that's, that's one of the benefits I see. You know, Mark, I know you've recently published some work uh, We're talking about power profiles on both sides of the lens. Can you talk to me? I know as, as in my practice, when I started ordering these digital customized products, I ordered a minus two sphere and got back this weird thing from my lab, like a minus one, eight, seven. I'm like, I, my foropter doesn't go there. I don't know about yours, but it doesn't. And then a, some weird cylinder. So can you talk about how that affects us in practice and why that's important as we're getting to the next level of vision? Yeah, when we study basic optics, um, you know, if we do tilt a lens, and you can see this yourself on a lensometer. You know, I'm only a 150 uh, myope, and if I tilt the lens on my lensometer, it doesn't change very much, but I'm aware of a little bit of change. You grab a plus five, even a plus five out of a trial case, and tilt it, and you'll see the amount of astigmatism you can induce just by tilting the lens a little bit. So it's the same when we put a lens in front of the patient. With the customization technology, with the measurement techniques we have here, when we prescribe a lens, particular higher power lens, we need to take into account the pantoscopic tilt, the face form wrap of the lens, the vertex distance, because in order to give, in order to deliver 
the power that we find behind the phorobter for that patient. We need to compensate the power of the lens for the little bit of tilt or wrap. And it can be only five degrees, but by the time you get to 10 degrees, we've got quite significant, meaningful changes in the as-worn power. And the advantage of the S technology is that we can compensate for that and deliver an optimal wearing experience for the patient. It may confuse us when we come back to measure the lens on the lensometer. But remember with the lensometer, the lens is going flat against the lens stop. When the patient's wearing the lens, the lens may be tilted 5, 10, 15 degrees. So the compensated power allows for that. Now the other thing that's really exciting about this technology is with traditional progressive addition lenses, we did all the progression on the front, and then as uh, Ryan said, we put the power on the back, the cylinder or whatever. We've never been able to leverage the fact that we have two surfaces. And uh, Essilor are, are really woken up to that fact by producing this really unique and revolutionary design where unlike, I, I always use my body as, a, um, <laughs> as an analogy for this. You know, the traditional progressive lens had a beer belly, right? You know, you've got your base curve and then it gets a little bulgy down the bottom, okay? This S technology is more like Ryan, okay? Ryan, he's got his base curve at the front, but it's flatter down here, okay? Now he's got a little, because of that, he's got a little more junk in his trunk, okay? But that's what's happening with this lens. We're leveraging the fact we've got two surfaces and we're able to minimize the magnification and therefore minimize the swim effect that we get from this lens. And for somebody who wears it, it's revolutionary. You know, with traditional progressives, you'd be very much aware of that swim when you first put a new pair on. With these new lenses, you put them on and it's like, wow, I'm, I'm still aware of a little bit of blur. Okay, I can't, I've got some cylinder out there, but I can live with that. The swim, that's more difficult. You know, that's just like an optical educator with great passion to sum an entire lecture up with one take home point. I don't think anyone's going to ever forget right here. That, that My beer belly? Yeah, that was impressive. I can yeah. see you all later tonight talking about that. <laughs> uh, one thing I want to, as we've talked about the presentation, one thing that I've said a lot is expansive vision. So I know when I first heard about this, I'm like you folks saying, oh, wait a minute, are you telling me that there's no blur anywhere in this lens. So can you kind of touch on that just a little bit for Yeah, me? I mean, you can still find the blur on the lens as a wearer. You know, progressive edition lenses are about, have always been about compromises and how we manage that in the design and coaching our patient to adapt. Those areas of peripheral astigmatism still exist in these lenses. But it's how that change in plus power is managed as we go down the lens in terms of leverage in the front and back surface design. And the same thing applies in the periphery. It's how that is managed and how that power is distributed between the front and the back surface. The blur is there, but I'm not troubled by the blur when I'm driving or doing a dynamic visual task. What bothers me is the rate of change of magnification. It's the magnification that occurs either when I look down through the lens and I see things get bigger, or when I look to the, when I move my head from side to side and I see this swim. So we're managing the, the surface profile through this nanoptics technology so that we can minimize the rate of change of magnification and that minimizes the swim for the patient.